Us again, everyone. And today we should all be very excited because we have a true psychedelic superhero uh, sitting before us, uh, Nick Sand, uh, inventor of Orange Sunshine, uh, a man who's had uh, a, a visionary and uh, long-lasting interest in in uh, psychedelics and, uh, and and DMT, which is uh, a particular interest to me. Uh, I guess he was uh, at one stage, and maybe he'll he'll address this. Um, known to have produced more DMT than than anyone else on the planet. Um, big round of applause for Nick Sand, please. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Chaba and the organizers and drivers and uh, all the people who have made this uh, such a uh, fun experience. Um, and I guess I'll start off uh, uh, talking about uh, my early days at school when I was studying anthropology. And I began to discover that there was a, a lady up in... Uh, um, Oaxaca, uh, Maria Sabinas, who was uh, uh, performing the mushroom ceremonies. And I went up there and uh, Steps of my hero Albert Hoffman, uh, who had also made that journey earlier, and uh, we had a successful uh, journey with her. Um, we, uh, I then returned to uh, school and started studying anthropology, and uh, during this time, uh, I started making DMT. I think the first time I made DMT was in 1962, and. Uh, they made it illegal in 1966, and at that time, uh, my wife uh, started to get really worried. She was saying, um, I don't want to be a criminal's wife and all of this. And, and so I said, well, let's take a high LSD trip and see if we can resolve this problem. So we took 600 mics each, and the whole night was nag, nag, nag about you know, typical Jewish wife. And uh, so at one point I said, just let me go sit in front of the mirror. And I took my DMT pipe and I asked the question, what should I do? And I smoked one toke, nothing happened. Smoked another toke, nothing happened. But this is strange. I smoked the third toke, still nothing happened. On the fourth toke, everything disappeared. And uh, what happened to me was very strange because I come from, you know, uh, an atomic scientist who was an atheist. My mother and his wife, they were all atheists. Uh, they were lovely people. Um, but they said, uh, I shouldn't do this. And uh, so I got this message. Uh, your job in life is to make DMT turn on the world and raise the consciousness of the planet, stop the wars and the killing, and so on. During this time, I attended a lecture by Richard Alpert, who is now known as Ram Dass and lives in Hawaii. And uh, after the lecture, I went up and we chatted, and he suggested we go over to the student union. And uh, we went over to the student union, we hang out, hung out together, and the crowd thinned out, and there were just a few of us left. And I invited them over to my house to see my first primitive laboratory, my mom's basement. And uh, he was very impressed, and he said, uh, why don't you come up to uh, Millbrook? So I came up to Millbrook, 
And shortly thereafter, I became one of the guides there. And that's where I met Owsley. Um, Owsley Augustus Stanley III. He was the man who was the first person to set up, to um, create the implacable standards of purity. Uh, interesting thing about LSD and all of the other indulged psychedelics is that they will glow in the sunlight and if you make them highly pure, you have it in a tube or something, you snap them together, uh, they will slash light. So this is as within, so it is without. Um, <laughs> So then with Timothy Scully, um, I moved to California. I got arrested along the way, and uh, uh, they freed me after 10 days in jail for going through a stop sign, because I had a truck that was licensed recreational vehicle with all my equipment in it, five kilos of DMT, DET, assorted psychedelics. Um, so we sued. And a year later, the truck was brought back by one of my commune members. And we opened up the truck under the Bay Bridge. And we looked there, sitting right on top of the uh, two cartons was the flask full of uh, crude DMT and DET ready to be distilled. <laughs> oh, this is this fucking setup. You know, let's get the hell out of here. We locked up the truck and split and you know, went to other places where we could watch around the truck. No one came. I said, well, this is really weird. So we went back, we recovered the DMT, and I was with that DMT, I was able to make enough money to make the orange sunshine. Um, Owsley suggested I work with Tim Scully. Tim Scully was my partner in the orange sunshine uh, project. He is since then retired completely from any kind of pro psychedelic um, position. Uh, he lives with my oldest friend, Alice, um, up in Albion, California. And uh, I was invited down to uh, Idlewild, California to meet the head of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, John Griggs. And when we met, it was instant friends, and he took his mala and he put it around my neck. Took his off and gave it to me. And uh, I have since been friends with the Brotherhood people who live actually quite close to me in California. And we spend time together and trip together. So I was busted in 76, and I was kept for a long time in San Francisco County Jail. It's got to be one of the worst jails. And uh, after a while, I was there so long, I got to be friendly with one of the guards, and I asked him to transfer me to a cooler tank, because I was being threatened by rape with, uh, by some black guy, black power guy, who thought he was the chess expert in the uh, tank and I beat him at chest very easily and uh, he started getting upset about it and uh, so they moved me down to the trustee tank and uh, at the trustee tank uh, I became in charge of the person who uh, was handing out the food they had these big steam carts with this horrible food on it and they give trays of it into the prisoners and I'm supposed to make sure that uh, um, they don't get too much of it. Uh, so during the visit, my wife came and uh, she spat a balloon into my mouth, which I swallowed. And after a few days, it came out and it was in three balloons and I cut it open and then washed it very carefully, cut the next one open, washed it very carefully. And the third one, we made a solution in uh, Visine, which we got off the commissary. And so as we were going up and down the main line, um, we would say to the prisoners, one drop or two. <laughs> and, uh, and they would give us instructions and we would drop it into their food. And about an hour later, uh, all the prisoners would 
swinging from the bars and <laughs> dancing on the table, just having a good old time. And all the guards were hiding in the command center. I said, well, we don't know what's going on. I'm not going out there tonight, fuck that, you know. <laughs> So uh, then I split. After I got out on bail, I jumped bail, and I moved to Canada where I opened up a really nice lab, and uh, that was busted also, and they shipped me back. But the forensic scientists who worked for the, uh, uh, in Toronto, for the Canadian government, he said, this acid tests out at 106% pure. Uh, well, let me test it again, so it's only 104% pure. Well, this was a mystery to me for many years. And finally, I visited Sasha many years later, and I said, because he worked for forensics for the DEA. And I said, what's up with this? And he said, well, it's just because the reference standards are so much less pure than your material. So relatively speaking, uh, it was less pure. So. I spent the next 15 years on the lam, running away. I went to Mexico, Canada, had another lab, got busted there, sent back, went to prison again. Uh, then I split to India, set up another lab there. And that's where I met Rajneesh, now known as Osho, and stayed with him for eight years. Uh, three years in India and five years in Oregon, the commune there. And eventually, I got busted again in Canada, sent back, <laughs> and spent time at uh, McNeil Island in an eight-man cell. Um, and uh, some of the people there were uh, bank robbers, and one of them, Bruce, uh, had been uh, three generations, grandfather had been a general, his father had been a major, he was a ranger, commando, in Vietnam. And when he was in Vietnam, uh, I had sent over like bags full of orange sunshine uh, for the soldiers. And, uh, and they, he got one of these tabs. He was out on patrol, and he kicked back on uh, a hill and thought about it all. And when he came back, he uh, retired from uh, the service and became a bank robber and gave all the proceeds, proceeds to the Weather Underground. So back to McNeil Island, uh, I talked to the warden one day, I walk up to the warden, so it's a quadrangle, kind of like a university, with crossways in it, and a lot of roses, but they're in really bad shape. And the guard was just throwing chemicals on them and stuff. So I walk up to the warden and I shake his hand. All the prisoners are looking, oh, who is this guy, right? I'm going to snitch. And I say, look, these roses are in really bad condition. Why don't you let me work on them? So he switched me out of the laundry, ha, hallelujah. And uh, now I'm outside. And I got everything I needed, compost, and suddenly the whole place is just beautiful blooming roses. And they start to call me the Rose Man of Alcatraz, uh, the Rose Man of McNeil Island. So I spent my time there. I was released uh, after four and a half years for being a model uh, prisoner. And also because uh, they, my uh, wife, Usha, uh, gave hell to the probation people uh, because they didn't want to let me go. And she read them the riot act and I uh, got a letter and now released from uh, probation. Uh, one of the interesting things happened in that cell in McNeil Island was that there was a mafia hitman there and uh, he turned on with us. Uh, I said, oh, you probably not gonna want to. I said, are you kidding? No, no, are you kidding? I'm in jail, I'm gonna turn on with you guys. So he said, okay, we sat around a little, uh, in a little circle and the Garcia, the weekend guard, came by and he looked in and said, ah, oh, so peaceful. And we all took LSD and smoked the DMT. And uh, next day I talked to the mafia guy 
And uh, he said, that's the first time I've been to church in 30 years. <laughs> so, uh, are there any questions? Orange Sunshine is 300 micrograms of very pure LSD. It's been recrystallized three times and uh, it contains no ISO. Uh, how did you come out with, uh, with the knowledge that DMT could be smoked? Um, I think empirically. Uh, I, I, I knew I purified it uh, you know, by distillation. And so then I just put some in a pipe, and I smoked it, and <laughs> so there, you know, there it is. Uh, do you think DMT also has intelligence, just how ayahuasca have it, how we feel the plants for it, and all that to be present? And you think the hold the mic a little closer. Okay, I'm sorry about you. Do you think DMT also has the intelligence yeah, like ayahuasca when we ingest it? Um, well, to tell you the truth, I don't really care for ayahuasca. I'd rather smoke DMT. I like to do it at the end of uh, an LSD session. It pulls everything together. The LSD is a, uh, is a, excites everything, gets everything moving, mm -hmm. and the DMT weaves it into meaningful patterns. Uh, so, the ayahuasca for me is, I've made 5-methoxy-DMT, which is the active principle, yeah. which stops it all from being broken down. And I just find it nauseating. It's just personal taste. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we've got plenty of time for, for questions, so yes, please uh, raise your hand and Hello. give us some indication of where you are. Over there, in the front. I'm here. Uh, Georgia? Uh, so oh. I wanted to oh. ask, you still find something new and exciting every time uh, you take uh, <coughs> LSD or DMT? Like, does it still excite you and does it bring new joy and curiosity to you? It's been a while since I've done anything, anything like that because I've been traveling. Uh, I intend to do it soon. Uh, yes, I usually do find <laughs> something new and exciting. Now I would consider DMT. DMT the more spiritual one. That's again a matter of taste. Uh, I have a question. First of all, thank you very much for coming and sharing your life story with us. And I wanted to know, first of all, if you can share maybe a few words on the um, effect that the LSD has on the brain, like what it actually does for the brain to hear it from an expert. This is not my area of expertise. I synthesize these chemicals, I take them. Uh, I don't really know what it does. The brain is still a huge mystery to everyone. A brain is an amazing uh, organ. All right, thank you. And then my second question is, be, because you do combine DMT, that a lot of us have um, spiritual experiences with this, and if uh, by ayahuasca or other medicines, we feel that the spirit of the plant is alive. And then on the other hand, LSD, when, when I take it, I feel it, it is connect me to the spiritual place, but it's actually completely chemical. So what is your point of view on the spiritual connection? I think uh, the point of all of the psychedelics uh, is to put us on the spiritual path, to find our connection, our individual connections to God. Uh, it's the psychedelics that have taken me to uh, meet Rajneesh, uh, John Burney in San Francisco. Uh, I think it's, you know, kindergarten for the spiritual path. Uh, over here, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for your very inspiring talk. Um, how is it that you manage to maintain unwavering belief in spite of, like, prison sentences and all sorts. Well, what else is there to do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Yeah.
You're really gonna go, oh, woe well, is me, oh shit, here I am in prison, oh man, they've really fucked me. Or you're just gonna get on with it and see, you know, what, what good can I make of the situation? Thank you. I'd like to, uh, I kind of missed that description of LSD. Uh, it's a, um, oh, which one do I keep saying? It's magnifying a, intensifier. Yeah, magnifying intensifier. And the, uh, the DMT is a thing that weaves all of these impressions together into meaningful pattern and gives you your message. But again, it's about, ultimately it's about consciousness and moving into consciousness. Can I, can I just say that uh, I've just been told that there's somebody uh, smoking, uh, I guess it's tobacco. Here, can you not do that, please? Say okay. what? Uh, someone smoke. It, there's no no smoking allowed tobacco. Thank you. You're speaking. Raise your hand. Ah, uh, yes. So, um, my question is, I'm sure you're familiar with Terence McKenna. Uh, for those who are not familiar with him, he, is, uh, he was an ethnobotanist. And he also spoke heavily about the DMT. Well, anyway, he was also mentioning like, that he was able to metaprogram himself on a DMT trip. And that's, I was wondering if that's, something that, if, if that's something that you lived through or if that was your experience as well. Or, and if so, perhaps you can give me some kind of pointers, like, for example, how can I stop growing my hair or something like that? or maybe color my eyes a different way. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> because of the, of the fun, right? Oh, well, yeah. whatever you want to do for fun, you know, free freely. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, to be able to do things you do normally, like, uh, for example, grow your hair, or maybe shape your uh, Thief or whatever you do, and you don't really know how you do it, but you really know inside. And perhaps DMT can provide the assistance on changing these patterns of how your body actually works. I agree. <laughs> really? I think you can do that. All right, so perhaps you can give us some pointers on what to do, perhaps, not just to I think I've already gone over this. You want to be in a good place, okay? Physically and mentally. I like to fast for a day or two before a trip, but that, uh, skinny people have uh, more problems with that. So, um, that's what I do. Um, I think a meditative place to be, and then take your trip and your LSD trip, for instance, and then at the end of that, uh, when that starts to calm down, that's when I take the DMT and it weaves it into meaningful patterns and I get the messages. All right, but we are not talking about messages about, you know, we are talking about physical changes. Mm -hmm. So how would, how would you do this? Or did you ever do it? Like you made physical changes into your body and inside this matrix, out, you know, outside of, your perception? No. No. The only change that I've noticed that's been really positive is uh, human growth hormone. <laughs> human growth hormone, I take by injection and uh, it's made me younger. I'm 75. Many people say I look 50 or 60. Um, and it's wonderful material. It's not expensive. You can get it from China. Uh, <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> okay, can, can, we, can we, sorry, can we uh, move the microphone on to the next person, please? Okay. We'll keep it to one question that we, would be great. Anybody over here? Um, I think what he apparently meant, meant was about uh, what I do think. Through DMT and probably through LSD, you can uh, open and free your brain. Use maybe more capacity of it as it's in general use. And then what would me interest me if you have enough experience with taking LSD and DMT, and maybe in this kind of way, like 
I do believe that my telepathic powers are thinking on somebody and it's calling me or I'm doing it really frequently. Really, really. I've had that experience, yes. Uh, where, you know, you just look at someone and I don't know how it happens. Um, or maybe a twitch in the face or maybe you're feeling the same as they are but suddenly you know what they're thinking. And, uh, and that's been a very uh, helpful uh, thing in guiding trips because people sometimes can't really express what's going on for themselves and that telepathic connection uh, is very helpful in helping them out. Hey, um, hi there. So, hello. <laughs> so, uh, you come from like a time of like really uh, powerful, like psychedelic political activism, and I feel like now there is uh, maybe not so much of an obvious like change happening. Like in the 60s, there was so much, mm -hmm. like so much uh, psychedelic activism, and also just like general activism, which was, I think like eased and mobilized by the free flow of psychedelics. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts today about like, you know, what on earth can people do like to, to help uh, sort of affect more change in terms of uh, <laughs> this? this uh, <laughs> I understand your question. Yeah. Yes, uh, somehow I think that this time period that we're entering into, into now will be uh, eventually like the 60s again. I get that feeling. It's just my feeling, uh, but it's about time. <laughs> Hello, uh, here. I'm uh, wondering how do you make LSD 25 and do you need an <laughs> assistant? <laughs> Say again, please. How do you make LSD 25 and, ha and do you need an assistant? <laughs> uh, I haven't made uh, any psychedelics uh, for 20 years. Uh, thank you for the offer. <laughs> How do you do it? How do you do it? Oh, you take uh, lysergic acid uh, and you dry it for 24 hours under a high vacuum. Uh, and you take uh, an intermediary uh, receiver, like a one or two liter uh, vacuum side on and put it in dry ice, and you pump it down until it's absolutely anhydrous. And then using anhydrous technique, you dissolve it. Uh, the method I was using was to dissolve it in dimethyl formate, very oily, yucky uh, solvent to use, but at that time it was the only thing that really worked well. And, uh, and just slowly, um, uh, under cooling, uh, stir it, and uh, drop by drop, uh, you add the diethylamine, and uh, then you evaporate off the dimethylformamide, and you take the uh, brown uh, residue, and uh, you um, take that up in chloroform, and you run it through a chromatograph, about 200 mesh alumina uh, anhydrous, and you will start to see slowly moving down the column of alumina. I was using 40 millimeter columns, and you will start to see a rapidly moving blue zone, and you collect that rapidly moving blue zone, and uh, then you see a slower moving green zone. That's the ISO. So when you come to the end of the blue zone, you change flasks, and you um, start collecting the ISO. Uh, you evaporate off the uh, methylene dichloride blue zone, uh, and you neutralize that with tartaric acid, and you put a seed of LSD in, and it just starts to crystallize out. The ISO material uh, you save under refrigeration after you concentrate it, and after a while you can treat it with base. Uh, I would make up, uh, take a block of uh, sodium or uh, potassium 
and very carefully clean it. And uh, then I would uh, add uh, methanol to it to make potassium methoxide or sodium methoxide. And that is what I would treat the green zone residues with. And that would flip the diethyl amide group back around to the normal form, which gets you high. And it's a laborious and tedious process. It takes weeks uh, and a lot of devotion. I can speak really loud. But we, we would like to record it. Um, we are recording. We have a microphone. Whilst Come you're, in. Whilst you're synthesizing have... these chemicals and the times that you did get busted, that would have put a major um, halt on um, the progression of that. What were, when you got busted, were they just by chance or was there a mistake that was made for, for that to happen and how would you make that? Um, Getting busted is always a mistake. <laughs> a, a, a mistake of yours? That was, yes. That could be... Absolutely. And how would you minimize those mistakes? Excuse me? How would you minimize those mistakes? I'm not understanding you. How would you reduce those mistakes to a minimum? I'll be by being more careful. And, uh, I would watch who was following me. Uh, I would. I always kept separate warehouses for the chemicals, separate warehouses for uh, the laboratory equipment. I used elaborate uh, uh, methods of movement and storage for storing them, and then choose a uh, obscure location and then have a commercial company move the company. Uh, like for instance, I had all of my stuff in, uh, in the Bay Area and I moved to Missouri and opened up a, uh, what was it called? Uh, DNH Custom Research, right in downtown St. Louis and met with the police chief and the fire chief and they were very happy that I was bringing you know, new business down to the center of St. Louis, which was you know, basically a slum. And, uh, and I had a beautiful house uh, that uh, I rented from the uh, head of the Prudential uh, Life Insurance who lived up in Chicago. And I lived there and that's, I had a laboratory in the basement and a laboratory in downtown uh, <clears throat> St. Louis. And I was very careful and I got busted. Actually what happened was I went to a Grateful Dead uh, <laughs> concert over the holidays and I did not inform the uh, post office. And the mail piled up and piled up and it was overflowing all the advertisements for Christmas time. And uh, that would made them suspicious and they went in and broke in and they found out that there was a laboratory there and then they found the one in uh, downtown. And when I got back after Christmas, I was arrested. And uh, you know, jails and prisons that went on for years. That was for not. I should have made sure that someone stayed there during the uh, Christmas time. It was actually a cat that got me busted. The cat couldn't get into the house, and somehow it managed to get the window open, and uh, that's what let the cold air in and ran out the tank, and so the, the pipes froze. And then when the police came up, they looked. They saw water coming down the stairs, and they said. Ah, must be a dead person upstairs. So they broke in, and of course, of course, threw this out later. Uh, but the damage was done. I would like to ask a question here. Here. I have a question right down here. I would like to ask. Here. Thank you. Um, I would like to hear your point of view, since you said that before you take your trip, you fast and you meditate, and I'm sure that you're creating a very sacred and balanced environment. Um, I, I'm a great believer on that path, since the antennas of the universal wisdom is opening up to receive. But on the other hand, we are here in Ozora, 30,000, 40,000 people, and since 50,000. And, and we are here also to experience psychedelics. So what is your point of view on psychedelic in a party-related surrounding um, as a comparison to a self-realization journey? Uh, that's a difficult question because I think it's very individual. Uh, and 
and I think you just have to go for what you know. Um, I'm looking forward to trying something myself. <laughs> so, we'll see. Uh, have you tried toad medicine? Uh, organic 5-MeO-DMT? Uh, yes, I have. What's Not my cup of tea. What, uh, I think you were experienced, you were a victim of bufotenin, which has a lot of physical symptoms. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, I had that. a good time with Maria Sabinas up in Wildla. Yeah. And that was good. Yeah. Yeah, the rumba mushrooms are very sacred, for sure. Thank you. Did, did you try changa? Let me just have her. No, I have not tried changa. Uh, have you ever tried Salga Divinorum? And if so, can you compare it to LSD and DMT? Uh, I don't know what Changa is. I haven't tried it, and so I can't answer that question. My question was about Salvia, Salvia Divinorum from Mexico. Uh huh? Salvia. Oh, Salvia. No, again, I haven't tried that either. Okay, thank you. We grew Hello, Salvia. my name is Omra, and uh, I've been working with DMT as well for the last three years of my life, and channeling a lot of information. And I was, I know that we've been like shut down by our pineal gland, now the system from birth. You start getting shots, uh, vaccinated, have heavy metals that go up to your pineal gland, fluoride, like lots of chemical. Bombarding, that's not good for the pineal gland. And I want to ask if you have any experience, advice, tips on decalcifying the pineal gland to reach no. these states of consciousness without... No, I have never met the pineal gland. <laughs> <laughs> However... Thank you. Okay. Can we have it now here? So, Georgia, work yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I've got it. Um, I just wanted to, to, to the people that were asking about the brain and the, what's going on with the brain um, on LSD, there's a, a person in England named Amanda Fielding um, who has done many, is working on that right now with lots of different scientists, has given incredible forums. And um, there's no doubt that the blood flow to the brain on LSD is definitely increased. The oxygenation of the brain on LSD is definitely increased. And um, so there's a lot of science that is coming to back up, um, you know, what all of us have perhaps felt on one psychedelic or another, that they do affect the brain and they, they affect the brain in a very positive way, chemically speaking. I mean, you know, bodily speaking. Biochemically. Yeah, biochemically. Yeah, just real quick for people interested in the neuropharmacology, you should check out Robin Carhart Harris's work and the uh, research into the default mode network. Uh, it's really fascinating stuff and is literally the cutting edge of neuropsychology. Hello. Hello. Hi. Nice uh, to meet hi. you. Hi. Hello, <laughs> I just man. wanted to ask you if you've ever encountered anything, any beings on oh. any of your psychedelics that you've tried? Yes. What, yes have you, what have you seen? Uh, well, I mean, they came, came in a variety of forms, you know. Some were like beautiful godlike things and some were a little like uh, snarly, you know, like uh, pig-like things. Uh, but uh, by and large, they all gave me the same message. Uh, have you seen the elves? I have not ever seen any elves. I've seen uh, enlightened pigs that talk to me. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what messages did they give to you? Uh, it depends on where I was, what time over you know, the last 40, 50 years, uh, and what was relevant to my personal life, what I was going through, what I needed to go through. Um, for instance, one time in Zihuatanejo, I was having a rough time with my wife in Mexico, this is. And I went down to the end of the beach and I sat on the rocks and uh, sat on, on, against the rocks there, big, huge rocks. And uh, I started smoking the DMT and uh, 
suddenly I was uh, in a room with these like large, beautiful people uh, having like a little cocktail party. And I was like this little guy, you know, trying to like look over their shoulders and jumping up and down. And uh, one of them turned to me and he looked at me and he said, you shouldn't be here, you're in no state for this. He threw a lightning bolt uh, at my feet and I was sitting down holding the DMT pipe. Thank you, thank you. I have three questions for you. No, just one. Just, just one. one? Just one. Okay. Each other. Where are we? Uh, usually, when I smoke DMT, yeah. I feel like I leave my terrestrial device and I'm in this... You feel what? I feel like I leave my body and uh, I see a lot of light. But one time this didn't happen. I had a toothache and the only thing that happened was that I had a blood rush in my tooth uh -huh. and it disappeared. No more toothache. Cool. Yeah, well that's a very curative drug. What can I say? Okay. Hello. Uh, I would like to know if you believe that... Raise your hand wherever you are. I'm okay. here. Yeah, there you are. I would like to know if you believe that during the death of human beings, the DNT is unleashed in the brain and uh, people feel the effect of it. And if so, uh, what's the reason for this kind of behavior? I have never heard of anyone dying or having really bad reactions from uh, using too much DMT. No. Endogenous, endogenous if, rush at death. If it's released in your brain when you die, DMT. Oh, well, I'll tell you that when I die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Could be. Yeah, <clears throat> well, my voice is a little it's destroyed, okay. but whatever. So what is your <clears throat> stance on when working with psychedelics for spirituality, on keeping balance between rationality and irrationality? And by that I mean like, yeah, I saw these angels, aliens, dragons, whatever, and they told me this and that, and I'm going to listen to that. And knowing that science is not bullshit and blah, 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 blah. So keeping balance between both things, what do you think about that? Um, well, when I'm working and uh, I get a lot of uh, material in my system, uh, I just have to work through the hallucinations and stay concentrated on what I'm doing. Um, I'm quite used to being in a hallucinatory state, so um, one time I was recrystallizing LSD and I had been getting a lot of LSD in my system. And the flash started to boil over and I just thought, oops. And I grabbed it and pulled it off and put it on the, the counter and I sucked my fingers to cool them off. And I was, oh my God, it's 10,000 <laughs> mics of acid. So I had to go lie down for four hours and I got up and started working again. Somebody else with the. Hello? Here? Here? Hello? Um, I wanted to know um, what do you think about meditating on LSD? Uh, raise your hand. Ah, say again. Um, what do you think about meditating on LSD? Great. Good idea. <laughs> Go for it. It's always good to be meditating on... Uh, I mean, you're taking any of the psychedelics is a meditation, but putting a conscious focus on it is very important. Very welcome. Uh, Nick, Nick, I wanted to ask you a question about um, the origins of smoking DMT. Of course, we weren't always smoking DMT. And, and I understand that uh, you, you fell upon mm -hmm. uh, vaporization uh, oh, yeah. by, by Tell chance. how I did that. Tell right. us about that. Yeah, I was uh, making DMT in my mom's basement okay. early on. and. Uh, I was there with Alan Bell, a dropout from Harvard, and uh, he's Bostonian, and Michael Smith, uh, both of whom are now deceased. And uh, I had a little bit of crystal uh, EMT on a piece of aluminum uh, foil, and I said, could you pass that to me? And in doing that, it bumped the uh, aluminum foil and it 
piece of the uh, uh, DMT dropped onto the hot plate and suddenly it vaporized and I saw it go up in smoke and I thought to myself, whoa, this could be a novel way of ingesting it. So I took one of my little round bottom flasks and uh, put a little screen in it and went upstairs and sat in front of a mirror and started smoking and that turned out to be a very good way to take it. Indeed, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, so many great um, discoveries are made by accident. It's like divine accidents. Yeah, that's a very good example. What year was that? Pardon? What year was this that? This happened uh, early on. Started making it in 62. I would say 65, 1965. Yeah. Fascinating, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, somebody over there? Actually, I have wanted to actually just answer the question about uh, the environment and fasting. But I would say that uh, I usually go to the booths and meditate before I take it. It's really yeah, important to know what you are taking and why, why you are taking it, what you want to achieve with it. And about fasting, I do not prefer to eat meat on the day when I'm tripping. Uh, spiritual thing, and on the other hand, meat we needs a lot of uh, energy to burn down and all the energy which your brain would use uh, use it, we're going to use by your digestion systems like yeah, not to eat too much or like it's really really light food you have to eat and what I prefer and I would do tells everybody to do it okay um, I have another question down Hi. here. Yeah, I have. Um, how much do you feel that the experience in the medicine has positive effects in your life, um, like changing effects? So you you shared with us that for you the purpose was you know, to stop the war and to heal people basically. Mm -hmm. So how much you feel that in your life this has actually happened and that it has led you to be a better person, a better human being in yourself and others? I think that has happened and I think I'm still working on it and it's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe that there is a danger that people could merely use it for entertainment? And for what? For entertainment and lose the, the intention. Yes, I do. I've seen it happen a lot. If that's what you want to use it for, that's your choice. Personally, uh, I agree with you. I think fasting is good. Um, the, the meat question is not really that important. What's important is that your stomach is empty and that uh, you're in a meditative spot and uh, you're in a quiet space. Uh, I have been doing yoga and meditating since you know my early 20s or earlier. And uh, I found it very uh, helpful, and I still do it. Thanks. Um, over here. Hi. Um, Sasha Shalgin uh, suggested that if you add a methoxy group to the fourth carbon in the benzene ring, as opposed to the five to make five methoxy, if you add it to the fourth, it makes it, um, it gives it a greater capacity for passing the blood-brain barrier and will be about five times stronger than 5-methoxy and about 25 times stronger than DNT. Do you know of anyone that has synthesized that? No, I don't. I'm familiar with the uh, theory, but uh, no, I don't. I haven't myself. Thank you. Do you approve the theory? Uh, are you, did you, uh, is this true? Like if you add the methoxy group at the fourth position, would it be stronger? Would it cross the blood-brain barrier faster? I have no idea. It's, it's, it's more strong, yeah. It's 5-MU-DMT. Uh, it's more strong. Yeah, but I want the chemical uh, fact. Uh, why is it more permeable? Why 4 and not 5? Then you are more, more strong. Okay, we, we need to... Uh, uh, you can't uh, make a connection at the four point because that's already a uh, saturated bond. Five is the first one that's substitutable. So 
someone at the front here. Hi, uh, I just want to ask you if you can compare like high dosage of psilocybin versus DMT trip. I'm talking about 10, 15 grams. Uh, say again? Uh, the, the psilocybin, if you take in high doses, if you can compare the trip to DMT. Uh, yes, I think, well, I mean, psilocybin and, and DMT, basically, psilo DMT is part of the structure of uh, psilocybin, as it is in LSD, Logan, DET, all the indole ones have inside of their structure the DMT molecule. Okay, so let's say that the trip can be very similar. I'll say again? Uh, the trip can be very similar, the experience from both. Uh, in high doses? Mm, I find the psilocybin, uh, because of the other alkalis in it, can be heavier. Uh, and that pure DMT uh, is just more straight to the point. Uh, I have a friend in Ecuador who makes a San Pedro brew for us. And I have also a uh, large amount, a friend has a large amount of psilocybin mushrooms, dried psilocybin. And he suggests taking four grams, two to four grams of psilocybin mushrooms about the fourth hour of the San Pedro session. And San Pedro, that the way they make it there, it's got no 5-methoxy in it and uh, is almost a straight mescaline. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so we've got about five or ten minutes left for questions. Uh, anyone over here? Uh, George, you got someone in the middle there? You said you uh, met Osho in India. Can you tell us more about your meeting with him? With whom? Osho. 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 Oh, Osho. Oh, well. Uh, I went to Osho fairly early uh, and uh, went up to Pune, and uh, I uh, just spent a week or two acclimating to being in India, and uh, went in to take uh, uh, sannyas with him, and uh, I was there with my daughter Sunal, and uh, my wife Nidosh, and uh, uh, he grabbed Nidosh by the head, and held her third eye and shook her head vigorously and uh, my daughter you know, she, he touched her lightly and with me he just brushed his finger uh, on my third eye and I thought hmm I guess this guy likes chicks more than he does guys <laughs> and uh, I went home and uh, I went through five days of vomiting intense headaches uh, I wrote questions to him he said yeah it happens and uh, and uh, I was a devoted uh, disciple after that. It Thank you. Very powerful. It's got a lot of shock. Uh, maybe time for a couple more questions. Um, how were you introduced to acid in the first place, or when was the first time that you took it? Uh, the first time I took acid was at Millbrook, and uh, I uh, went to a talk by uh, Richard Albert, now known as Ramdas, at Brooklyn College, and then uh, I went upstage afterwards, and then we retired to the student union, and uh, we uh, then uh, uh, I suggested that he come back and see my laboratory and uh, he was impressed and he said why don't you come up to Millbrook and I went up to Millbrook and I was uh, made a member of the belief for spiritual discovery when Tim got back. I still have a handwritten letter by Tim. When did you first take LSD? Uh, when did I first take LSD? In Millbrook. Um, I'm not sure I remember, 61, 64, somewhere, somewhere around that. Did you take it with Ramdas? 
Uh, no, I took it alone. Uh, they had gotten their first LSD in a long time from Charles Schroes of London. And uh, so they, you know, were a tightly knit group. And so I got to be up in this uh, attic space all alone. And I took about 600 mics and uh, it was a very powerful trip. And <laughs> afterwards I uh, went down and joined them. Um, how do you think the psychedelic scene has changed from the 60s to now and what, in which ways do you think it remained the same and what do you think about these changes? Well, um, I think we're coming along as a race. Um, I'm optimistic. Uh, I kind of really like uh, uh, Bernie. Uh, he's been pushed out. But uh, he comes from the same borough of New York that I did. And uh, uh, I think, as I said before, I think we may be coming into a new era of uh, more enlightened government, hopefully. But, you know, I'm not really impressed with Hillary. And, of course, she's got, you know, uh, the whole thing together. Uh, so we'll see. Can I add to that in any way? Um, I actually asked, how do you think the psychedelic scene, like the people, the culture, uh, the music, everything, and you know, how it changed since the 60s until now, and what do you think about the changes, like also socially? <clears throat> um, I see less war, uh, although it is still, you know, the most powerful way of making money. Uh, in the world, um, and uh, you know, I hope, I hope that you know things will continue to improve. Um, I don't see any real major changes yet. Uh, there's less war, there's less killing, and that's good. Uh, I've always been, I've been a pacifist all my life, so um, okay. we we it's just our common prayer. Let's make this our common prayer that, you know, this ridiculous killing and maiming of everyone for in the name of money and the God dollar uh, starts to fade away. Hopefully. Thank you. I think this is a very good night to so end you on. Um, it's been a lot like listening to our great uncle, our great psychedelic uncle talk for the afternoon. So uh, thank you, Nick. And, and, uh, before you give him uh, a warm round of applause, Nick is going to be joining us uh, this afternoon for a panel. Uh, it's called Sacred Plants and Entheogenesis. And, uh, uh, and uh, if you want